So we're about to start our career in podcasting, Jill. Here we Here go. We go. This episode has been supported by Bow Concept Scotland, with whom we've been collaborating since 2003. The Danish interior specialist offers a range of adaptable furniture and accessory designs for the home and workplace, as well as a free interior design service, installation throughout Scotland and a lifetime guarantee. Bow Concept has showrooms in Glasgow and Edinburgh City Centre, alongside their commercial contracts department, which operates across the UK. For more information, visit bullconcept.com. Hi, I'm Jill Welsh. And I'm Alec Drew, and welcome to the brand new Homes and Interiors Scotland podcast. This is the first episode in a series of monthly podcasts we're producing where we'll be discussing all things related to home and living. Each episode will pick a topic and invite a guest to come in and talk about it with our editor, Jill Welsh. Some of our listeners may be familiar with our print magazine, Homes and Interiors Scotland, and others may not. For those that are, some of our guests, topics and discussions may feel familiar as we draw on inspiration from the magazine, but those who have never read the magazine, don't worry, the podcast is designed to be enjoyed by everyone. Of course, if you're interested in finding out more about the magazine, then feel free to head over to our website, homesandinteriorsscotland.com for more information. This week's guest is very special indeed. For the first episode, we wanted to introduce you to our editor, Gillian Welsh, who will be leading the podcast and discussion in the episodes to come. So, hello, Jill. Hello, Alec, again. Jill has worked at the magazine for nine years, but has had an illustrious career in journalism before that, from several editor jobs at the Scotsman Publications, including Lifestyle, Fashion and Features, and editing number one magazine also. During her time at the magazine, she's overseen the introduction of our renowned architecture supplement and was at the helm of the 100th issue of the magazine back in 2015. She lives with her partner and son in the West End in Glasgow. The first question I'm going to ask you, Jill, and I understand you get asked this a lot, is what's your home like? It's a conversion of an old two-storey house. It was once a children's home and it's now been split into four flats. Mm -hmm. We live on the ground floor, so getting outside doesn't involve an excursion or a day trip. Mm -hmm. It still, it still feels fairly new, even though we moved in a few years ago. I've been used to tenement living for the majority of my life. Um, decoratively, there's still a long, long way to go. The hall is now white, no longer beige, with black, two black ceiling lights that my partner sourced from somewhere in Norway. He got a lot of, um, a lot of happiness out of that. The house functions, but saying that, I still have to stand on a bar stool to turn the heating on but that's due to change with the renovations planned for the future. <laughs> um, having a little outside space has been a major bonus. Um, it allows my son to practice his football when it's dry, of course, and me to hang out the washing. Great. That's nice. And one of the things you said there, yeah. um, you talked about tenement living, mm. and I'm just thinking for um, some of our listeners who uh, may be from a bit further afield from Scotland, tenement living might be something that's a bit unfamiliar to people um, who aren't from the area. So what, what do you mean by tenement living when you say that? Well, tenements are those kind of classic buildings and structures that you get in Glasgow and various other cities, <laughs> and um, shared space, close life, yeah. uh, shared yard, uh, back gardens and things like that. So... And also having not the easiest access to the outside, mm -hmm. so it involves stairs, yeah. climbing stairs and things like that. But yeah. certainly it was a good, happy tenement upbringing, <laughs> yeah. but I'm just not used to living on ground floor yeah. with a garden next to me. So I must say, when I first moved to Scotland, um, the close was a complete mystery to me. Mm -hmm. um, down south, generally, a close is a, a, uh -huh. a cul-de-sac. So when people kept talking about yeah. the close, I, I got quite confused quite often. I That's wasn't right. really sure what they were talking about. Yeah. But um, I just thought, yeah, the tenement living, when you mentioned that, mm -hmm. it's, it's um, I think that's that's quite a Scottish thing, I must say. Yes, I mean, is. people from other cities in England might disagree with me, but um, there's certainly that, that Scottish culture of tenement living and shared space that mm -hmm. you talked about, which... Um, yeah, I think far from being uh, unpleasant or cramped, it's, it's quite a special experience. I think it's quite a uh, it's quite a unique but quite a special experience, and certainly a, a core part of living in a city like this. Absolutely, yeah. especially in the west end of Glasgow, for sure. Leading on from that question, then um, I wanted to ask, what does home mean to you? This is a really good question, and to me, it's just about uh, the moment, certainly. 
the feeling that it gives you and for me ultimately it's about my family mm -hmm. a place that's safe and friendly mm -hmm. it's a really interesting question it's, it's one that we'll be asking a lot of the people um that, that we talk to on the show because i think um home is one of those things that can mean very different things to different people and i think there's any right or wrong definition of, that's right. of what home is it's really what it means to, to the individual oh, absolutely moving on from that then can you describe your dream home another good question <laughs> it would definitely have to be practical mm -hmm. right not through working on homes for for years now and definitely well proportioned proportions were really key to i think good living mm -hmm. and um Efficient living as well. Lights a big would play a big role. So I don't want to see the light and how it moves and changes as the day does. Um, it's definitely got a simple layout. It wouldn't be a statement in any way inside or out. It's not big, but there's space to breathe, space from each other, <laughs> survival techniques as I call them, um, and somewhere you can maybe dance. Okay. A little bit sometimes. Uh, it features concealed, definitely have concealed storage to complement its layout and form and shape inside. It's got understated modern elements here and there and updates and some classic styles. Uh, one of my favourites is Tongue and Groove, but the, the modern take or would be wide planks painted in white, so they would feature, that would feature, you know, throughout. Um, it's definitely got easy access to the outside where there are blossom trees. Um, stairs, I think, wouldn't feature, ideally. So one level would be the aim and definitely a utility room. And when you talked about tongue and groove, what did you mean? I kind of, when you said about dancing and then you talked about tongue and groove, I suddenly <laughs> yeah. thought, is there a link well, there that you want to be able to? Tongue and groove is just a way to, to adhere wood together right. in panels. Yeah. It's really nice, you normally see seen in panels and bathrooms and things like that. It's quite nice you said that as well because you, you talked about um, the home being practical. Mm -hmm. So, and the tongue and groove is one of these features that uh -huh. it, it features both practicality, but mm -hmm. it is also has a, a design and an aesthetic to it. Yeah, that's very understated as um, well. Yeah. Um, it adds a lot, a little bit of interest to, to walls yeah. and around doors and things like that. Yeah. So. And you can also match cupboards as well. Mm -hmm. My concealed storage. Yeah. <laughs> if money was no object, then what is the first thing that you would buy for your home? Well, this links directly to my dream home. <laughs> so I'd definitely commission a cabinet maker to right. build storage, that concealed storage mm -hmm. in Tongue and Groove, and <laughs> also a tree house for my son, oh, nice. who's requested... Also, a wall-mounted television where he right. can watch football with his friends and where he'd be free to shout and ball and cry when his favourite <laughs> team, Arsenal, don't win. So, <laughs> a place for him to grow up and to experience, but also something that we could use as well as adults. Mm -hmm. um, again, understated, but working with nature mm -hmm. in nature. And that's a really nice answer as well because it links back to what you said about what home is for you. It's, it's, it's very much, you've just answered then a lot of things around your family. Mm -hmm. So your family would seem to be the key focus of that, uh, yeah. of that answer. Uh -huh. And um, buying something that works for you all together in this space. Um, mm -hmm. And I suppose it quite nicely links back to what we were saying before about living in Scotland as well and having that sense of, of shared space. Maybe, that, maybe that's something yeah. that comes up of tenement living be, and enjoying yeah. that sort of shared space and shared culture. Absolutely. It's also maybe the place where we could dance. You know, yeah, well. that's true. <laughs> <laughs> that would might involve a double height ceiling, I'm not sure. <laughs> Next question then. Who is your design hero? Mm, it's very difficult, very difficult to answer. And to name one, there's so many, so many people, so many talents, um, out there and people that have obviously that feature in the magazine um, who, we've written, who we've written about I'll name a few or certainly a couple here, Victor Papanek um, I really appreciated or appreciate his, his democratic approach he was a designer and he was committed to improving people's lives through good design, mm -hmm. adults and children so um, definitely him, also 
artists. Um, I remember when I first saw um, the work of the German visual artist to Toma Apps. She won the Turner Prize in 2006. Mm -hmm. um, it was pretty incredible in terms of her work. Um, as well as lesser known Unsung Heroes, um, who feature in the magazine alongside the bigger names. And they include cabinet makers, woodworkers, bakers, tier designers, and, and as well as fashion designers. Mm -hmm. You talk a lot about wood. You talked about <laughs> cabinet makers, and you talked <laughs> about a tongue grooving thing. Do you, do you find is 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 wood a big um, in your sort of design and style? Do you, mm. do you do you enjoy like I suppose wood is one of these very sort of tactile materials, mm -hmm. isn't it? And we work from it. Well, certainly I did from quite a young age in uh -huh. school and. Um, I definitely appreciate wood more than I've ever done. Yeah. Um, I realise that the skill involved in creating beautiful furniture and pieces from it is, is highly specialised as well. And I also like the smell of it, mm -hmm. its colour, the fact it's slightly unpredictable yeah. as well. And um, I also like it's, it's, it's robust, mm -hmm. it's solid, there's a sort of strength to it. Yeah. And it's very expressive as well, isn't mm -hmm. it? I mean, if you think about wood, it, it comes from a tree, it, it comes from life. And because of that, every piece of wood has its own individual characteristics mm -hmm. and its own, you know, even if you've got, you know, two pieces that were made to the same template, they would have their own, mm -hmm. their own kind of unique um, features that are a product of, of where they came from and the trees that they were cut from and, and you know, the environment and the experience mm -hmm. of that. Um, then comes through into the into the piece. Mm -hmm. From take that to fondue, <laughs> everyone loves a good comeback. Um, what interior product or period would you love to see have a comeback? <clears throat> well, it's neither a product or a period per se. It's more the thing, and it was ha habitat. <laughs> and the reason why I say that is because I used to visit the Glasgow store in the eighties with my dad. <laughs> every Saturday, or maybe even a Sunday, actually. I'm sure it was open on a Sunday. And we'd go in the morning. We wouldn't buy much or we wouldn't buy anything. Maybe some discounted mugs. <laughs> but certainly, um, it was such an experience. Mm -hmm. I was obviously a lot younger then, but seeing all these innovative things, um, it just got me. Even the tills were trendy. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the sound of the tills. Yeah. But certainly seeing the pieces, the furniture, the accessories, the colour, the materials that they used um, in their designs um, was really quite mind-boggling. So habitat. Habitat. Maybe you could never rule at that moment. Many of our listeners, I imagine, are probably quite familiar with reading magazines and looking at magazines. Uh, however, I suspect um, a lot of them are probably less familiar with what goes into actually making a magazine. Uh, with that in mind... I was interested in understanding a little bit more about what a magazine editor does and what the job entails. Well, we collate and communicate ideas in the best way for readers, um, loyal readers and new readers, um, through beautiful imagery and sharp writing. So using your imagination is key mm -hmm. as well. But being able to do this means working with a like-minded and dedicated team Editorial team, of course, advertising, digital and production too, and mm -hmm. um, being open to ideas and to their ideas, researching, writing, thinking about how to and why, and asking those questions and feeling comfortable about doing so, being taught and being able to speak and communicate to and with new people from all walks of life, you know, professions, young and old, working with them and finding their talent, recognising their hidden gems and telling their story. Exchanging ideas happens on a daily basis. Decision making too. Not so much problem solving, but certainly <laughs> you have to address that. Taking criticism, art directing and shoots and working with really good photographers and being on weather watch constantly. <laughs> Commissioning, editing images, reading copy. And then you've got the admin side of the job as well, which is absolutely key. Planning, updating, admin and filing um, and also keeping the commercial hat on at all times watching updating and learning about social media is key mm -hmm. especially at the moment um, thinking of new ways to market the brand and and the business organizing budgets um, 
attending events, networking, uh, being flexible, uh, traveling, getting to know Scotland. It's been great. <laughs> it is great. Going to trade shows, attending design events, giving out subs forms and talking to people you would never expect to talk to. It's usually very good, you know. Um, not being glamorized. This is not a glamorous job that people might think. Yeah. Um, and being okay with that, mm -hmm. of course. Working hard at all levels, never really stopping. <laughs> On the go, all On the, the time. Yeah. yeah. That, that's, that is um, quite an immense list, I think, quite yeah. a broad skill set. Um, you know, it's from what you've said, it's not just, uh, it's not. It's not just writing pieces no. or writing articles. It sort of extends well beyond that. Um, that you know, with, with some of the more day-to-day -day admin tasks that you talked about, mm. there are a lot of, um, I imagine, a lot of interesting and exciting experiences that you get to go through. What is it that you enjoy the most about ad editing the magazine? Well, um, gosh, that's another hard question. <laughs> um, Seeing the team's ideas come to life in the printed format is very rewarding. It's uplifting. It's, you know, something to celebrate. Um, art directing and shoots as well with photographers, editing those images that come in, as well as all the, the product images that come through, various press agencies and things like that. Um, seeing all this amazing design, all this talent. Um, writing features is good. It's a very involved process. Um, meeting and interviewing the people to have stories to tell with incredible skill. Something you said there struck with me. Um, you talked about ideas um, coming to life. I imagine there must be something quite satisfying for for you and what you do. But I think something maybe a lot of people can relate to, particularly people who might class themselves as makers. Mm. Um, and the motivation for being a maker it's it's, it's this process of um, seeing an idea sort of come to fruition and, and then become something. Yeah. Do, do you find that yeah. there's this immense sense of satisfaction when the magazine comes and yeah. you, you kind of know that, you know, you made this and, you know, co collaboratively, as you said, you know, there's, there's a lot of people involved in the process, but that, that you played a part in and you, you created this thing that, you know, that, that, that went from being an idea to a reality. Well, an idea is essentially an abstract, yeah. in an abstract format. So, once you think about the how to put it into the printed format, mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a journey that it goes through. Yeah. And um, they usually work. Yeah. <laughs> and that's through thinking about it, analysing it with your teammates, um, working out the best way it could be executed within the magazine through imagery mm -hmm. and writing. Yeah. So it is rewarding. Yeah. I imagine there might be a slight downside to that if there is perhaps a piece that you particularly like and you're particularly attached to, but maybe you can't find a way to um, to realise that in, in in the wider context of the magazine? Is that something that happens very often? Do you have to, to make difficult decisions and cut pieces that you're quite attached to? That Yeah, there's always an, a, a slight emotional attachment to things that you've written. That's natural, especially when you've met the people that you're interviewing mm -hmm. and things like that. However, there's other factors that are involved when it comes to press time and these factors can involve pagination change, things like that. So you have to make decisions quite quickly sometimes in order to get the the magazine out on time to the printer in time. Yeah. Um, that's the business side of it as well. Yeah. And we're also very careful about what we do and how we cut things, but certainly if we do have to do that, some things can be put forward into the next edition. Mm -hmm. um, and but we think about it as a team. Yeah. And come up hopefully with the best the best solution. And that's nicely said, I suppose the idea that the, the idea that an idea is never lost. There's always a uh -huh. there's always a place for it and a journey. It, yeah, it goes through the same journey process. We asked you in advance to put together a quick how to guide on anything that you would like. So what have you got for us? Oh, this is great. Now, I attempted to answer this properly today, and I attempted to actually to do it at home the other night. How to clean behind the radiator. Oof. Now, it's still a work in progress for me, 
Yeah. And I'm hoping I can get back to you on this after the Easter break because that's exactly <laughs> what I'll be trying to do this weekend. How to clean behind the radiator. Mm -hmm. Does anyone have the answer? I, I have had the duster. Perhaps. There we go. That goes back to the previous question about actually what would you love to see make a comeback? Feather dusters. Nice answer. Definitely feather dusters. Other than that, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't tend to look behind my radiator, if I'm honest. And the reason I don't tend to look behind my radiator, and this could be the next how to leading on from this, is because how do you paint behind a radiator <laughs> without taking it that's off a, the wall? That's a question too far. Uh, yeah, and we, we've got, uh, yeah, we, we did our living room recently, but weren't quite able to get as far behind the uh, behind it as we'd have liked with the uh, with the paint rollers we had. So um, for that reason, I don't tend to look behind mine. <laughs> so if anyone does have any suggestions for us on how to clean behind a radiator, we'd love to hear them. <laughs> um, you can get in touch on our social media. We're on Twitter, um, Homes Int Scott Mag. Uh, Instagram, Homes Ints, or search Homes and Interiors Scotland on Facebook. Um, any suggestions <laughs> would be great. Likewise, any suggestions on how to paint behind a radiator, preferably without having to take it off the wall. <laughs> we are all ears. Um, I can finally finish painting my living room if someone can give me that advice. Well, thank you for listening. This was the first episode of our new podcast series. If you enjoyed it, please be sure to rate and review it and subscribe for future episodes. Thank you once again to our sponsor for this episode, Bow Concept Scotland. For more information, visit bowconcept.com.